Section four of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume four. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Capricia Page. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume four. Section four Against Inconsistency in Our Expectations by Anna Letitia Barbald As most of the unhappiness in the world arises rather from disappointed desires than from positive evil, it is of the utmost consequence to attain just notions of the laws and order of the universe that we may not vex ourselves with fruitful wishes or give way to groundless and unreasonable discontent. The laws of natural philosophy, indeed, are tolerably understood and attended to. And though we may suffer inconveniences, we are seldom disappointed in consequence of them. No man expects to preserve orange trees in the open air through an English winter, or when he has planted an acorn, to see it become a large oak tree in a few months. The mind of man naturally yields to necessity, and our wishes soon subside when we see the impossibility of their being gratified. Now upon an accurate inspection, we shall find in the moral government of the world, and the order of the intellectual system, laws as determinate, fixed, and invariable as any in Newton's Principia. The progress of vegetation is not more certain than the growth of habit, nor is the power of attraction more clearly proved than the force of affection or the influence of example. The man, therefore, who has well studied the operations of nature and mind as well as matter, will acquire a certain moderation and equity in his claims upon providence. He never will be disappointed either in himself or others. He will act with precision, and expect that effect, and that alone, from his efforts, which they are naturally adapted to produce. For want of this, men of merit and integrity often censure the dispositions of providence for suffering characters they despise to run away with advantages, which they yet know are purchased by some means as a high and noble spirit could never submit to. If you refuse to pay the price, why expect the purchase? We should consider the world as a great mart of commerce, where fortune exposes to our view various commodities, riches, ease, tranquillity, fame, integrity, knowledge. Everything is marked at a settled price. Our time, our labor, our ingenuity is so much ready money which we are to lay down to the best advantage. Examine, compare, choose, reject, but stand in your own judgment, and do not, like children, when you have purchased one thing, repine that you do not possess another which you did not purchase. Such is the force of well-regulated industry, that a steady and vigorous exertion of our faculties, directed to one end, will generally ensure success. Would you, for instance, be rich? Do you think that single point worth the sacrificing everything else to? You may then be rich. Thousands have become so from the lowest beginnings, by toiling and patient diligence and attention to the minutest article of expense and profit. But you must give up the pleasures of leisure, of a vacant mind, of a free, unsuspicious temper. If you preserve your integrity, it must be a coarse spun and vulgar honesty. Those high and lofty notions of morals which you have brought with you from the schools must be considerably lowered, and mixed with the baser alloy of a jealous and worldly-minded prudence. You must learn to do hard, if not unjust, things, and for the nice embarrassments of a delicate and ingenuous spirit, it is necessary for you to get rid of them as fast as possible. You must shut your heart against the muses, and be content to feed your understanding with plain household truths. In short, you must not attempt 
to enlarge your ideas, or polish your taste, or refine your sentiments, but must keep on in one beaten track, without turning aside either to the right hand or to the left. But I cannot submit to drudgery like this. I feel a spirit above it. Tis well. Be above it, then. But do not repine that you are not rich. Is knowledge the pearl of price? That, too, may be purchased by steady application and long solitary hours of study and reflection. Bestow these, and you shall be wise. But, says the man of letters, what a hardship is it that many an illiterate fellow who cannot construe the motto of the arms on his coach shall raise a fortune and make a figure while i have little more than the common conveniences of life et tibi magni satis was it in order to raise a fortune that you consumed the sprightly hours of youth and study and retirement was it to be rich that you grew pale over the midnight lamp and distilled the sweetness from the greek and roman spring you have then mistaken your path and ill employed your industry what reward have i then for all my labours what reward a large comprehensive soul well purged from the vulgar fears and perturbations and prejudices able to comprehend and interpret the words of man of god a rich flourishing captivated mind pregnant with inexhaustible stores of entertainment and reflection a perpetual spring of fresh ideas and the conscious dignity of superior intelligence good heaven and what reward can you ask besides but is it not some reproach upon the economy of providence that such a one who is a mean dirty fellow should have amassed wealth enough to buy half a nation not in the least he made himself a mean dirty fellow for that very end he has paid his health his conscience his liberty for it and will you envy him his bargain will you hang your head and blush in his presence because he outshines you in equipage and show lift up your brow with a noble confidence and say to yourself i have not these things it is true but it is because i have not sought because i have not desired them it is because i possess something better i have chosen my lot i am content and satisfied you are a modest man you love quiet and independence and have a delicacy and reserve in your temper which renders it impossible for you to elbow your way in the world and be the herald of your own merits be content then with a modest retirement with the esteem of your intimate friends, with the praise of a blameless heart and a delicate, ingenuous spirit. But resign the splendid distinctions of the world to those who can better scramble for them. The man whose tender sensibility of conscience and strict regard to the rules of morality make him scrupulous and fearful of offending is often heard to complain of the disadvantages he lies under in every path of honour and profit could i but get over some nice points and conform to the practice and opinion of those about me i might stand as fair a chance as others for dignities and preferment and why can you not what hinders you from discarding this troublesome scrupulosity of yours which stands so grievously in your way if it be a small thing to enjoy a healthful mind sound at the very core that does not shrink from the keenest inspection inward freedom from remorse and perturbation unsullied whiteness and simplicity of manners a genuine integrity pure in the last recesses of the mind if you think these advantages an inadequate recompense for what you resign dismiss your scruples this instant and be a slave merchant a parasite or what you please if these be motives weak break off betimes and as you have not spirit to assert the dignity of virtue be wise enough not to forego the emoluments of vice i much admire the spirit of ancient philosophers in that they never attempted as our moralists often do to lower the tone of philosophy and make it consistent 
with all the indulgences of indolence and sensuality. They never thought of having the bulk of mankind for their disciples, but kept themselves as distinct as possible from a worldly life. They plainly told men what sacrifices were required, and what advantages they were which might be expected. Si virtus hoc una potes dare, fortis omissis, hoc age delicis. If you would be a philosopher, these are your terms. You must do thus and thus. There is no other way. If not, go and be one of the vulgar. There is no one quality gives so much dignity to a character as consistency of conduct. Even if a man's pursuits be wrong and unjustifiable, yet if they are prosecuted with steadiness and vigor, we cannot withhold our admiration. The most important characteristic mark of a great mind is to choose some one important object and pursue it through life. It was this made Caesar a great man. His object was ambition. He pursued it steadily, and was always ready to sacrifice to it every interfering passion or inclination. There is a pretty passage in one of Lucian's dialogues, where Jupiter complains to Cupid that, though he has had many intrigues, he was never sincerely beloved. In order to be loved, says Cupid, you must lay aside your aegis and your thunderbolts, and you must curl and perfume your hair and place a garland on your head, and walk with a soft step and assume a winning, obsequious deportment. But, replied Jupiter, I am not willing to resign so much of my dignity. Then, returns Cupid, leave off desiring to be loved. He wanted to be Jupiter and Adonis at the same time. It must be confessed that men of genius are of all others most inclined to make these unreasonable claims. As their relish for enjoyment is strong, their views large and comprehensive, and they feel themselves lifted above the common bulk of mankind, they are apt to slight that natural reward of praise and admiration, which is ever largely paid to distinguished abilities and to expect to be called forth to public notice and favor, without considering that their talents are commonly very unfit for active life, that their eccentricity and turn for speculation disqualifies them for the business of the world, which is best carried on by men of moderate genius, and that society is not obliged to reward any one who is not useful to it. The poets have been a very unreasonable race, and have often complained loudly of the neglect of genius and the ingratitude of the age. The tender and pensive Cowley and the elegant Shinston had their minds tinctured by this discontent, and even the sublime melancholy of Young was too much owing to the stings of disappointed ambition. The moderation we have been endeavouring to inculcate will likewise prevent much mortification and disgust in our commerce with mankind as we ought not to wish in ourselves, so neither should we expect in our friends. Contrary qualifications. Young and sanguine, when we enter the world, and feel our affections drawn forth by any particular excellence in character, we immediately give it credit for all others, and are beyond measure disgusted when we come to discover as soon as we must discover the defects in the other side of the balance. But nature is much more frugal than to heap together all manner of shining qualities in one glaring mass. Like a judicious painter, she endeavors to preserve a certain unity of style and coloring in her pieces. Models of absolute perfection are only to be met with in a romance, where exquisite beauty and brilliant wit and profound judgment and immaculate virtue are all blended together to adorn some favorite character. As an anatomist knows that the racer cannot have the strength and muscles of a draft horse, and that winged men, griffins, and mermaids must be mere creatures of the imagination, so the philosopher is sensible that there are combinations of moral qualities which never can take place but in idea. There is a different air and complexion in characters as well as in faces, though perhaps each equally beautiful and the excellences of one cannot be transferred to the other. Thus, if one man possesses a stoical apathy of soul, acts independent of the opinion of the world, 
and fulfills every duty with mathematical exactness, you must not expect that man to be greatly influenced by the weakness of pity or the partiality of friendship. You must not be offended that he does not fly to meet you after a short absence, or acquire from him the convivial spirit and honest effusions of a warm, open, susceptible heart. If another is remarkable for a lively, active zeal, inflexible integrity, a strong indignation against vice, and freedom in reproving it, he will probably have some little bluntness in his address not altogether suitable for polished life. He will want the winning art of conversation. He will disgust by a kind of haughtiness and negligence in his manner, and often hurt the delicacy of his acquaintance with harsh and disagreeable truths. We usually say that man is a genius, but he has some whims and oddities. Such a one has a very general knowledge, but he is superficial, etc. Now in all such cases we should speak more rationally. Did we substitute therefore for but? He is a genius, therefore he is whimsical, and the like. It is the fault of the present age, owing to the freer commerce that different ranks and professions now enjoy with each other, that characters are not marked with sufficient strength. The several classes run too much into one another. We have fewer pedants, it is true, but we have fewer striking originals. Everyone is expected to have such a tincture of general knowledge as is incompatible with going deep into any science and such a conformity to fashionable manners as checks the free workings of the ruling passion and gives an insipid sameness to the face of society under the idea of polish and regularity there is a cast of manners peculiar and becoming to each age sex and profession one therefore should not throw out illiberal and commonplace censures against another each is perfect in its kind a woman as a woman a tradesman as a tradesman. We are often hurt by the brutality and sluggish conceptions of the vulgar, not considering that some there must be the hewers of wood and drawers of water, and that cultivated genius, or even any great refinement and delicacy in their moral feelings, would be a real misfortune to them. Let us then study the philosophy of the human mind. The man who is master of this science will know what to expect from every one. From this man wise advice, from that cordial sympathy, from another casual entertainment. The passions and inclinations of others are his tools, which he can use with as much precision as he would the mechanical powers, and he can as readily make allowance for the workings of vanity, or the bias of self-interest in his friends, as for the power of friction or the irregularities of the needle. End of section four. Recording by Capricia Page.